Thanks. Um, so this is one of the uh, uh, outputs from the uh, working groups that you're, you've heard some of already, and you'll hear more of um, over the course of, uh, I guess, this afternoon and, and, and certainly tomorrow, uh, related to family history. I, uh, after hearing um, Reed Tuxen and the payers' uh, discussion, I decided to put breakthroughs in healthcare as a subtitle for, uh, <laughs> for this group because um, the, t the, the definition of breakthrough that I heard was something that would improve quality and, and take cost out of the system. And I think family re history really has that potential to do it in, in, a, in a very short period of time in the near term. Uh, so um, uh, as you heard from the sequencing group, we've had uh, this, this group emerged um, out of the December uh, Genomic Medicine II meeting. Um, and uh, we've had four, uh, four meetings, including uh, at that one. Uh, um, our goals were to develop an agenda that would really help advance family history into clinical medicine uh, and to develop ideas and concepts um, that actually might be responsive to, a, uh, to an RFA or other funding opportunities, either uh, from NHGRI or um, other, uh, other, other funding sources. Now, when Terry um, uh, gave her overview of, uh, of why we were here, I, was, I, I noticed that, in contrast to some of her prior talks, that, that she didn't have a Far Side cartoon. So I decided to make up for Terry's uh, deficiencies and indicate, um, you know, certainly uh, family history um, is underutilized. Uh, it's poorly documented in the medical record and has a, uh, a significant opportunity to identify individuals at risk. Uh, certainly, uh, many studies have documented the advantages of family history in identifying risk characteristics that GWAS uh, has, uh, has really uh, missed, missed out on, uh, with odds ratios 2, 3, and 4 for family history-derived information as opposed to uh, from some of the genome-wide studies we've seen. Uh, so that's the reason why we're pursuing this. Um, uh, we, over the last uh, three uh, calls, we've, we've grown in size. We have, uh, you know, a, a diversity of, of individuals representing uh, a number of institutions and organizations that have participated in our, in our discussions, and I put the E uh, to indicate those individual inst institutions and organizations that are part of Emerge, um, because I think uh, having uh, electronic medical record integration as part of uh, uh, an objective becomes uh, something that could be quite important for, uh, for, for, for family history. So uh, as you heard earlier, I think from Rex, uh, that um, we came out of the uh, December meeting um, with a, a, an interesting and diverse list of, of topics uh, that, uh, to develop a outcomes research agenda um, linked to family history implementation um, and to really to use the principles of implementation science to understand how one might put family history into the, into the clinical workflow in a number of uh, diverse clinical environments. Uh, we thought that, um, uh, that we might coalesce into some type of advisory group that would uh, help inform um, particularly NIH um, clinical trials and other studies of where the opportunities might be to uh, introduce and capture family history uh, information, which is uh, often not done, um, and also to provide um, educational tools to both the patient community and the provider community on, the, on both family history, its merits, uh, and, and its importance. Um, as you'll hear, we, uh, we also uh, have spent some time thinking about how to explore um, electronic media, particularly social um, networking media, to help patients gather family history in the community. Um, and also, how do we validate family history was, became uh, an important question. Patient, particularly patient-reported information, how, how valid is that? And I think the, uh, an ideal uh, goal, um, aspirational goal, is to take family history data, molecular data, clinical data, and build the ultimate risk model. And so as we thought about these over the last several calls, the red are, indicate where we've really prioritized our efforts, uh, at least as, uh, up, up until today. And I think what's highlighted in blue are really the, our correlative goals that I think we, we could achieve if we approach uh, the three that are highlighted in red. Uh, so um, one of the um, first topics that came up was, well, what is the landscape of family history tools that are out there? Um, and, of course, the Surgeon General's tool has been, has been mentioned here and, and are familiar to, I think, most of you. Uh, and a number of um, uh, organizations have created their own. Um, and uh, I think uh, you may have heard uh, us present on uh, uh, a family history platform that we developed uh, at Duke University. Um, Intermountain Healthcare has developed uh, one of their own, and several others, uh, including the University of Virginia, 
uh, were mentioned, but we decided one of the things to do was to have a, a bake-off, uh, meaning a, compar a way to compare you know, amongst all the stakeholders in our working group, at least give them an exposure to the, to the opportunities. So we, uh, we had a webinar in which we uh, looked at both the, uh, the Mitri tool, as the Duke University tool is called, and the Intermountain Healthcare's Our Family Health tool. So just briefly, for those of you that couldn't participate, um, Mitri um, was developed uh, around 2004 and 2005 and is a uh, web-based uh, tool that is um, uh, where patients will enter their family history data, perhaps with some guidance from, uh, from a navigator or some type of uh, uh, counselor in the office if they need it. Uh, the, uh, the goal is to collect three generation family histories um, on as many individuals as possible. Uh, the software is set up to handle 48 disease areas. Uh, our um, clinical decision support tools have been developed for um, the four areas that you can see here, uh, three cancers and uh, um, and, and thrombosis, and the, uh, uh, the platform generates uh, a pedigree, a tabular family history, and provides a report both to the provider as well as uh, to the patient, and I'll show you an example of those in a moment. Um, it, given its 2003-2004 origins, uh, it's a pretty um, boring user interface right now, uh, using radio buttons to enter information, um, but I can tell you that uh, there's, a, there's an iPad version that uh, will be launched sometime in the next uh, few months that um, is pretty nifty. Uh, so I'm just going to take you through a couple of screenshots that are pretty obvious about entering information about your relatives, their names, their ages, whether they're alive or dead, um, and whether you actually, or, or whether you actually don't know, um, and, uh, <coughs> and also who um, you might have, uh, might have talked to to gather your family history information. And then at the end, when you exit the program, there's a, there are a number of surveys that are done to look at uh, your understanding and comprehension of what the information, what, what you did, uh, how it might have uh, helped you in some way, and, and also some process measures that uh, uh, we can talk about later. Uh, so the report, um, one of the reports that's generated, as I said, is a fairly standard uh, family um, pedigree that, um, that you're quite familiar with. And then there's this tabular version of the same report uh, that is also generated, uh, and these are generated for the providers. And interestingly enough, and I think this has been found by others, the providers actually prefer this way of representing family history over the pedigree. Most, particularly in primary care, most providers really just don't understand the circles and the squares and, and a bunch of other things. And it's very hard for them to, to distill it down into, into um, something that's meaningful. Not that I'm not sure that they, what, they, what meaning they got out of this, but they, they certainly prefer it. Um, as I mentioned in the, uh, the Mitri tool, there's a patient report that is really meant to encourage the patient to, to, be, to take action. So it really tries to explain to them uh, why they should be talking to their physician about something that was triggered in their family history, uh, what perhaps is some of the rationale for it, and, and also where they could seek out other information uh, to become more educated about this. And at the same time, the provider gets a uh, a similar type of series of information that is uh, very top line actions that they should be taking and if they're interested in drilling down further why those actions are recommended and even further what is what are the guideline basis for those actions uh, to be recommended in the first place so depending on provider interest there's uh, lots of opportunities to um, uh, to go down uh, this menu and I should say uh, that um, in this particular family history tool um, the decision algorithms are based on um, either U.S. Preventive Task Force recommendations or um, uh, uh, ask uh, or um, uh, cancer cancer uh, society recommendations. So it's really guidelines driven decision support that's that's underpinning uh, these recommendations. So uh, the other tool that was uh, uh, that was demonstrated was the uh, Intermountain Healthcare's uh, uh, family history uh, platform, um, which is accessed through the patient portal. I should have mentioned that the uh, the Mitri tool is accessed outside of a, of a patient portal. It's a standalone uh, entity at the moment, um, and it really uh, is really a nifty tool. Very very sleek and and well well done. Uh, I think this was really the reason why when Mark was at Mountain Healthcare that that it was uh, <laughs> that this tool was created was to to really uh, snoop around and figure out who was related to whom. But nonetheless, um, you know they've really done a fantastic job when. When you uh, look at this interface, you have a number of choices of how to enter the family um, history domain, either to just uh, just begin to piece together um, uh, 
uh, your pedigree or to just if you're not um, sort of graphically uh, inclined, you can just enter numbers of uh, the people in your family. And if you already have had your ancestry done, you can directly import your ancestry data. And in the background, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the software will assemble your, uh, your pedigree. And there's a lot of nifty dra drag and drop opportunities with these icons. The ProBand is right here in this diagram. And you can begin to add um, many, many relatives, probably more than you probably want to have in your family, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, display. And this is actually Grant Wood's uh, family. He was very clear that, he, that this is OK to disclose uh, his, uh, his, his, his family tree. I don't know if the information is actually correct. So you get this nice display of, of a pedigree. It's available through the portal. It's also uh, on display for you and for your provider. And you can import other information about your, uh, about your health, um, other conditions you might have. And there's a, on the, the right-hand side, you can see there's a searchable, um, there's a searchable uh, feature in there where you can actually look for syndromes that you've been told you might have or your family might have and, and document th those as well. So at the end of the day, not only do you get a nice pedigree, but you also get this, all, this, um, uh, this sort of um, uh, filed uh, uh, this, this file type of report that again, even in the uh, in the Intermountain Healthcare system, is seems to be um, preferred way of displaying family history to the uh, to the pedigree uh, illustration. And if we look at these two um, software platforms side by side, um, in many respects they compare quite well. Um, the, the information is patient entered from both, uh, is web accessible, um, either at a kiosk in the, in the waiting room or uh, at home. Um, a number of the informatics elements are, are in place for both. Um, the, uh, the Mitri tool, I think, uh, has um, embedded in it algorithms that lead uh, ultimately to a decision support mechanism that is, uh, I think, uh, quite attractive. And I think that's, that's generally what we're all looking for. Uh, but the, uh, the Intermountain Healthcare tool is not that far behind a number of, uh, a lot of the work that's going on right now um, with our family health is uh, implementing the algorithms and developing the CDS tools that will enable it to also function in that way within the in Intermountain Healthcare system and perhaps others. Uh, so at least in, uh, we were able to accomplish one goal of really beginning to compare and contrast uh, what types of um, uh, platforms uh, and, and uh, and, uh, and characteristics they have um, and begin to think about which ones we might implement in a uh, future research project. So um, in the last uh, uh, teleconference our group had, we, we began to kick around, uh, well, so what are the ideas? What are the things that we really want to push forward um, as, as opportunities? Uh, so one, and I think this came from a number of the um, groups that were using EPIC um, and potentially uh, other um, uh, electronic health records was to really think about how how would this integration occur? Um, how does uh, do you integrate family history collection, um, software, and decision support into um, existing electronic health records that are also being developed and implemented across many healthcare delivery systems today? Um, and possibly to do this in the context of an SS STTR um, or uh, SBIR type of uh, mechanism um, with Epic or perhaps Cerner or others. But the, the, uh, I think you can see this list of, of really critical questions that uh, need to be addressed uh, for this to happen um, about standardization of the information, both on the input side and the output side. Also thinking about what are the information gaps uh, and the workflow gaps that need to be addressed for this to happen uh, seamlessly. So really critically looking at that, um, uh, that information flow pathway and how it occurs in the context of real world clinic visits and making sure that the information is captured and delivered at the right time points to be most effective. Uh, I mentioned the validation of the information that's collected from the, uh, from the patients um, and uh, the idea that, uh, of the possibility of bringing in other applications like Mitri, for example, that is a third party tool and how does that interface, how do we create uh, the notion of interoperability be between these uh, possibly, and making the family history readable in the electronic medical record all seem to be reasonable um, uh, things to be investigating with some of the um, producers of electronic medical records. Um, I think it was uh, Mark, and I'm also a friend of Mark's, uh, that um, uh, made the recommendation that, uh, that there's a, there is this, uh, series, this is group that is um, uh, Outside of uh, what we're doing here um, is uh, has developed clinical decision support tools and a clinical decision support sim 
uh, uh, consortium has, has developed that uh, would, would be great to link to that, as well as to make, this open, make anything that we're talking about open source so that um, many different systems can take the software and modify it to meet their needs and integrate it into their local environments, which I think are very reasonable things to be considering as well. So this was um, idea number one. Um, idea number two, um, which really uh, came from Jonas Almeida, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Almeida, at uh, University of Al Alabama, um, is really to um, take um, the social networking uh, media that we have today, Facebook type of applications and, and the sort, as a, as a way and an opportunity to capture family, uh, family health history data. Um, and so uh, visiting um, both, uh, you can see at the bottom of the slide, some of you, that there's a, uh, there's a website uh, for a YouTube video uh, that Jonas made uh, to, to demonstrate this concept, at least some of the early phases of the uh, development of the, of the, mostly the informatics mechanics to allow this to happen. Um, so the API has been established. Um, there's, a, there's a prototype. Uh, it uses the cloud in ways that I could not describe to you, but maybe Jonas can. Um, and it really allows the patient and their families to capture uh, the information uh, in, a, in a diverse and, and effective way. At least that's the goal, to use the Surgeon General's tool as at least one of the ways to do this in a standardized way. Um, so, um, Jonas, I, if you have a second, do, do you want to elaborate on, on what I said? Because I'm sure I didn't do it justice. Sure. Uh so the, the social media world has been developing and maturing, and now we actually have something we call social computing. So there, there is an infrastructure we can use in our applications, and family history is a natural fit, or, or genomic history for that matter, it's a natural fit to this sort of architecture. So the, for, for those who, who like these technical details, it's called open authentication. There was a first version that was very awkward, we explored last time we met, and since then the, this protocol has enabled a different and a much more abstract use of social computing. So to give you an example, for instance, if, if you have relatives that like you, you can ask them to fill their part of your medical history the same way that you fill their part of their medical history. So and you can imagine the same thing for the way a family history would uh, interact with a genomic core facility. So the genome is somewhere which requires quite a bit of storage. And again, this external entity could be a, a partner that is uh, incorporated in this social computing. So what happens is that the, the, the center of this network of dependencies has all its full control and awareness of which web services are engaging or storing the data that describes the medical history. Thank you. I, I mean, to me, this, this sounds like a, a very cool idea, one that is uh, you know, certainly going to take advantage of, of, our, of the networks that we are already developing. Maybe we're not as networked with our families as this uh, type of uh, um, strategy would require, but, uh, but you never know, and I think and we're going to talk about it, I think, a little bit later uh, tonight. So the third idea, and the last idea, really, uh, that I wanted to talk to you about was um, really how to think about a family health history intervention at, that measures um, uh, certain outcomes. And uh, again, I mentioned this before, but um, we really want to think about a project that would uh, optimize how we collect uh, family health history data and how we bring it to the point of decision um, uh, with the provider. Um, predominantly in the context of an EHR, although that's not a, a formal requirement, and to measure um, and demonstrate that, the, uh, that there are improved outcomes, and we can define what those outcomes might be uh, as a result of this um, uh, intervention at various stakeholder levels. And the stakeholders we're thinking about are the, the patient, provider, and the system. Uh, so um, we talked about a number of potential uh, environments in which this could take place, and primary care was certainly um, uh, uh, top on, uh, on, on our list, uh, but uh, uh, one, one interesting idea was also uh, to think about how family, health ha fa how family health history might actually um, influence decision making in an emergency room, uh, in an emergency department uh, situation, um, particularly in the context, for example, of, uh, of whether somebody might be having a thromboembolic event or a myocardial infarction or something of, the, of that nature. So there's, there's a lot of more discussion to think about, but that would be a pretty interesting and unusual area to explore. The notion of uh, bringing it to um, other, um, other environments such as rural practices, uh, underserved um, um, environments as well. 
and even to, the, uh, to, to help the next generation of physicians really learn the value of family health history to bring it to the practices where residents uh, uh, and interns and, and other um, uh, providers are being trained. And to do it in the sense of to understand whether this is really working in the real world. Um, does the intervention work under usual conditions, I think, is the question that was, that was asked. And the kind of study design uh, that we had envisioned was uh, something that um, is called a pragmatic cluster randomized trial. The idea being that, um, first of all, pragmatic, meaning it's, it's in the usual care environment. Clustered, meaning that some practice environments might have access to the intervention and others would not. That would be called usual care. And do that in some kind of randomized fashion that we can uh, discuss later. And while we were discussing this, this paper came out, um, which was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I could be wrong, the first publication of any outcomes research on family history. I don't know if, if anybody wants to differ with that statement. But this came from Nadim Qureshi at uh, the University of Nottingham. Um, <coughs> and what they had done was uh, essentially what we were talking about at the same time, a pragmatic um, cluster randomized trial um, of 24 primary care practices that received uh, family health history in information about cardiovascular disease, and the goal was to determine whether they could identify individuals at risk for cardiovascular disease more so using the family health history intervention uh, compared to the usual practices of the providers in those groups. So the salient features of that was, as I said, the, the trial design, about 750 individuals, none of whom had previously diagnosed cardiovascular disease. It was done in 24 primary care practices. This was not an electronic intervention. It was all done on paper. Um, and they found 4.3 percent compared to 0.3 percent having risk of cardiovascular disease in this study, which means if you, a typical primary care doc might see 10,000, or a primary care doc might see 10,000 patients a year, or even a practice might see 10,000 patients a year. But nonetheless, that means 500 patients were identified out of that 10,000 that otherwise would not have been uh, using the family health care. Um, family health history intervention, which is uh, not a, non, a non-trivial amount when you think about it in those terms. But they, hadn't, they didn't take it the next step. Um, they didn't follow these patients long enough, of course, to see whether um, those individuals, if they had an intervention in response to their risk factors, had any changes in outcomes. Of course, that would take quite a long time for this disease. So, but this was really an important proof of concept that this could be done for us. And I think uh, it really paves the way for, uh, for studies like this across the breadth of um, topics that we've uh, been talking about today, I think. So um, uh, what we have been thinking about, it, this is a very busy slide, but I've just kind of call your attention just to the center part, the color part, which is just, uh, you know, it's just a schematic of what a uh, family health um, history intervention trial might look like. Um, collecting uh, information at the outset as well as educating uh, patients, all done via the internet or web-based uh, uh, um, web design using METRI or um, other family health history uh, intervention tools that provide a risk assessment, clinical decision support, so that at the time that the patient is actually interacting with their provider, it's not about what is the information, it's about what the treatment plan, what the actions are. So it really, um, really jump starts the ability to do this without a lot of the um, uh, cost of the interaction that takes place right now if you do a family history at the time of the visit. And you could either go into, uh, if you're not at risk, have uh, routine screening, whatever that is. Um, if you're at higher risk, you might have uh, a uh, prevention strategy implemented or, or a screening strategy that could include uh, uh, genetic measures or other measures. And as the, the boxes that you find hard to read here really are about some of the outcome measures and information, both on the process side as well as on the on the, um, on the clinical side, uh, process measures as well as clinical outcomes that would be ascertained throughout this process, throughout this workflow. And uh, again, this is also uh, probably too much information for, the, for you to really read on this slide, but as I mentioned at the outset, um, this type of trial would really seek to look at uh, patient, provider, and systems measures. And if you think about it, most of the um, academic types of studies that we do um, are really focused on the clinical measures in the patient. But um, as we heard from the payers and others, maybe there are other things we want to measure that have nothing really or very little to do 
with those clinical measures. Maybe it's um, the financial metrics of the system or whether we're really retaining our doctors because they're much more satisfied with the way that they interact with patients and so they're really happy, and they want to see more patients. I mean, these are just hypothetical, but, but you can see there's, there's a myriad of, uh, of ways that we can really think about outcomes besides the box that we're uh, normally programmed to think in. Uh, so this is my last slide. Um, so the next steps would be tonight we're going to gather around and discuss some of these opportunities and perhaps more. Um, uh, we uh, thought at the end of our last call that we, for these three ideas that we would develop three subgroups like the... Uh, uh, like the genetics, uh, like the sequencing um, uh, group had done, but maybe, as Rex said, maybe we'll find that that is not, not the way to go and we'll all come back together. We'll see. Um, we hope that we will respond um, uh, in some way using family history as a demonstration, pro demonstration project for the RFA that we discussed uh, this morning. And we should really think about how to link this to some of the other working groups. Um, as, uh, um, the, uh, you know, certainly to the sequencing working group makes a lot of sense. And as uh, Marin and I were uh, discussing earlier today, um, putting um, sequence information in the context of family history could be quite powerful and really be informative about how to narrow the scope of where you should really be looking in the genome as opposed to looking at everything, which I think was a topic that we've discussed at uh, s several points during the course of the day. And then hopefully we can get uh, some feedback and advice from all of you and our invited guests, uh, the other stakeholders. Thank you. Um, Gene, and then Mark. Do you have data on the two instruments as to the completeness of ascertainment across socioeconomic class, educational uh, achievement, absent fathers, that sort of stuff? Um, I can't speak to the Intermountain Healthcare uh, tool on that um, for the for the for the Duke uh, uh, system. Um, we have had. Um, uh, a diversity of socioeconomic groups and educational groups use this intervention uh, with a high degree of success in capturing the information. Whether it's accurate or not still remains to be seen. But I don't think that we've, I think we still are fairly in a narrow scope. We, we would hope to explore that in broader populations going forward. And one follow on, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I wonder if there is a way of um, finding out how one can really identify families that you need to look into, um, sort of a cage um, approach to whether you should take a family history, a complete family history. I mean, what's the trigger? Well, you know, why would you do this in the first place? And are there a subset of people that we should be really fo focusing on versus all comers? And I don't know if uh, Marin or Mark or other people that have spent more time in family history than I have, uh, have uh, want to address that. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, conceptually um, it would be uh, relatively straightforward as people were entering or interacting with the tool that if you define certain thresholds, you could trigger ask drivers where you would begin to drill down and prompt them with additional questions, much as might happen in the office where when you hear a particular piece of information from a patient, you, you know, perk up, and then tie that perhaps into more, uh, so just to use the breast ovarian camp cancer example, that if you saw that the patient, you know, reached a threshold where there were uh, two patients under the age of 40 with breast cancer, then the tool would automatically go into, uh, say, a breast ovarian cancer risk app that would ask much more uh, uh, specific questions about that and would probably then trigger, um, uh, you know, a recommendation that would look very different than people that would be interacting the standard way. I think that's that's a reasonable uh, approach. It's one that uh, has been thought about, but it, it's one also I think that needs to be uh, studied to see how it might work. I wanted to, to just come back to the Qureshi study for, to make two quick points. One is, is that even though the study was not intended to nor was powered to detect any differences, they did find that in the intervention group there was a statistically significant uh, difference uh, in patients who either ceased smoking or reduced smoking, um, even in the relatively small numbers at a point, uh, zero, zero, one level, and that there was actually increased aspirin compliance based on the risk and it tracked with the risk that they were presented. So they actually did detect some at least secondary outcome measures that have chains of evidence to the primary outcome of uh, incident cardiovascular disease, which was quite interesting. The second point that I think was much more important was the accompanying editorial 
uh, to the paper, which was written by Al Berg, uh, who, um, at, of course, chaired the NIH State of the Science Conference on uh, on family history, which uh, fairly well trashed uh, the current level of, of evidence and importance of family history, who uh, in print ate crow, um, <laughs> which was very satisfying to those of us that know Al. Um, <laughs> um, uh, basically saying, you know, I, I, that this study has proved me wrong, that I didn't, first of all, I didn't think a study like this could ever be done, but right. the second of all, I didn't think it would actually show benefit. And so what he outlined in his last paragraph, he says, as a practicing physician, this is what I want. And what Jeff articulated in terms of the synthesis of, the collection and synthesis of family history in the clinical decision support that works into the electronic health record is what Al asked for. And I say, if Al asks for something, by God, we should we give, should it, give to it to him. We should give it to him, right. <laughs> Me? Well, I was just going to say that um, we have developed a rather short tool, eight questions. I presented it last time. It's embedded in our electronic health record at the VA. And it is, a, I would call it a screening tool for, for cancers, family history of cancers. And the follow-up is just making a referral for genetic services, so it seems to be working pretty well. Yeah, what's, what's the accuracy of uh, self-reported family history? Um, it depends on the disease, um, and there's not uh, great data on that. Um, for uh, things like diabetes, uh, heart disease, um, it's actually, in the studies that have been done, it's pretty good. Um, uh, for things like mental illness, uh, and in particular substance abuse, as you might expect, it tends to fall off. Now, that being said, I think it's also important to recognize that all the risk classifications that have been developed have been based on self-reported family history. So the, the, we're dealing with the usual empiric risk that we're getting out of that. So in some sense, if we have validated family history, we're going to have to redo all our risk estimates because they're all off. Um, and we've actually done that in uh, colorectal cancer utilizing uh, the Utah Population Database, which actually shows that in colorectal cancer, the, um, the risk estimates that are in use are, are reasonably good uh, empiric compared to the actual validated cases. But the interesting opportunity is um, particularly to build on um, uh, the social networking ideas is if you begin to connect uh, family members, particularly within the context of either a single EHR or in a health information exchange where you actually can identify the individual and know what their diagnosed diseases are, you can actually not only validate the information, you could pre-create the family history if you have enough of that information. So I think that's another interesting area of exploration that I know at uh, Intermountain uh, they're intending to, uh, to pursue using some tools that they have access to. Actually, it's a perfect follow-on, and uh, I am not a friend of Mark's. Um, <laughs> I've met him, and I'm not impressed. Um, <laughs> You've been waiting all day. To yeah, do that. all day, man. Um, the question I have is particularly with the social networking. Um, has anybody looked at what becomes the obligation beyond to the pro band? Um, and it just seems like there's a potential major um, ethical and care issues there. Well, I, I would agree. I mean, actually, I, I was thinking about you um, and when I was presenting, not other times, but just when I was presenting <laughs> that, uh, that in, you know, the whole concept of social networking and also, uh, the, you know, how we use health information in the context of a Facebook-like of application sort of has a series of questions that um, probably you'll have a great time with. Uh, but no, seriously, I, I, I think there's a, there is a policy and ethics agenda that has to be thoughtfully uh, conceived um, at the time that we really put out there uh, a uh, uh, social networking tool to capture family history. But I, don't, I certainly don't have the answer to your specific question. So, do you want yes, uh, just a few words. So I also don't have an answer to your question. The, the good news is that the way we treat governance is now being object of mathematical treatment, and people publish papers with mathematical descriptions of these dependencies, obligations, and what's called um, instantiations of user operators, so the relationship between a user or usage and the data entity. So the good news is that uh, the, the level of the discourse is becoming more interesting, more abstract, and W3C is uh, paying close attention to this, so the World Wide Web Consortium uh, 
So there are web standards that are emerging to address these issues. Hmm. Did you have a, a question? Or? Yeah, Jeff, I had a question about um, linking up with EPIC. And um, because within the Pharmacogenomics Network, we've also talked about know can we begin to work with these major EMR providers and so I guess I'm just curious whether that's sort of a hypothetical or you've actually had conversations and they're interested uh, sorry uh, no uh, this is this was an idea that was raised um, yes. just a few weeks ago on our last call by Kathy McCarty um, I don't know whether she's had uh, specific conversations on that um, Rex did you have you I mean well or I, others I that are working yeah, yeah. so the Emerge Network had um, not only uh, Cerner, but uh, not only Epic, but also Cerner and GE uh, at a steering committee meeting three times ago or something, uh, trying to engage uh, them. And then I know that um, some folks from Northwestern and I think uh, some folks from Mount Sinai have been very actively involved with their genomics working group uh, in terms of moving forward. And there was just a meeting last week uh, in terms of actually thinking about putting data into the electronic health record. So there's already something of a relationship. And the thing that's really going to change the landscape there is um, the meaningful use phase two criteria, which actually uh, articulates that one of the meaningful use goals will be representation of family history in the electronic health record. And really the vendor community right now is wholly consumed with creating products that are going to be able to hit the meaningful use uh, category so that people can get reimbursed for implementation, meaningful implementation of electronic health records. And so um, if that uh, persists in phase two, we'll have a much better um, a way to engage with the vendor community on this. Okay, so Irwin and Kate. Kate and Irwin. Kate. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on the EPIC question, and as Rex pointed out, uh, we at Mount Sinai and folks at Northwestern have been actively engaged with EPIC, and, uh, you know, from our experience, uh, they're very receptive to developing custom uh, connections with some external tools. I think that's a very feasible uh, proposition. Uh, with, uh, you know, some payments that you make to them uh, that are not excessive, but uh, certainly uh, it, is, it is feasible and certainly we've gone that path that is uh, certainly, I think, a worthwhile uh, investment and I think, you know, that's something to consider. But the, uh, the, 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 the danger here is that um, if, each of, if there's a number of modifications to something like an EPIC tool over time, it becomes a unique tool to whatever system it's being used in and it is, doesn't communicate across networks like we're trying to do. So, so I, my, I guess my plea is that we try to have this as a coordinated conversation and I think as customers of Epic, we probably are a powerful force and could actually negotiate well. I'm also not sure if they qualify as a small business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's why it would be an STS, STTR. So, so as an Epic user, I actually pulled up the family history tool in Epic while you were talking because I can access it from here, obviously. Uh, it doesn't actually look, I, I'm, I actually would like a little clarification of how you would work with them be, to improve their family history tool because it's actually very similar to what you're presenting, certainly that's coming out in the sort of tabular form um, if you look at it. And so I was actually unclear as to what you were proposing with Epic. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll just make, well, uh, the specifics of the Epic uh, proposal um, are really to um, think about uh, what's missing. Um, you know, so you just took a snapshot of it, but I think um, we might really want to consider in different practice environments, uh, different disease areas to try, to try to understand what the gaps are and help fill in those gaps so we have something that we all ha uh, at least have a consensus is the right um, information to collect. And of course, what EPIC doesn't do now is provide the decision support um, downstream of the collection, which is something that I think is desperately needed for, these, for the information to be used. And the collection tool only allows you under one brother, one sister, one grandparent. Uh, and it doesn't define sides of family, and there's an infinite number of deficiencies in that particular web form, and the number of diseases that are represented as structured data elements is very, very small. So it, the, 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 improvement, uh, the improvement needs to be uh, uh, start over. I think we'll move the hook on. coming. Yeah, <laughs> well, 